Just tell me when. <laughs> I started and I can cut off the beginning so if I have to. Yeah, cut off the beginning. Let's let people arrive. When the Certainly, numbers stop yeah. going up, we can welcome them. Is that a TV in your room? Oh, that's Matthew. I hear him. You can hear Matthew? I can hear Matthew. Oh, snap. <laughs> it's okay. You can mute yourself. Why, yes, I will definitely be muting myself. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome, attendees. We're going to get started here in a few minutes. They can hear me, right? Yeah, they can hear you. Where's my cursor? Huh? Okay, fantastic. Great. Can I have a cursor? Oh, cursor does this. Okay. Oh, there, I figured out how to see everyone. Hmm. All right, I think we can probably get going now. All right, everyone, so please uh, welcome to the LambdaConf 2020 Global Edition. Uh, if this is your first session, uh, we're doing one talk a week on a different topic, and we're covering a variety of different programming languages. And this week, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Bartosz Milewski, who will be covering monoidal catamorphisms. I've known Bartosz for, I've known of his work for probably six, six or seven years now. And in my opinion, there's probably a no person who has taught more category theory to more programmers or made as much of an impact on getting programmers to think about programming as a mathematical endeavor than Bartosz. And um, it's also been my pleasure to attend several of his talks in person. He's a very gifted teacher. He is a polymath, if ever there was one. I think your background is in physics, right? Yes. Yes, the background in physics, very strong in math, strong in programming. Uh, one of the old C++ programmers like myself from way back in the day, <laughs> been doing way too much C++ programming, probably. And I'm very excited to listen to this talk today with you all on monoidal catamorphisms. So please, if you are here, then virtually welcome <laughs> Bartosz by, you know, clap, clap, or clap emoji, or whatever you want in uh, the Zoom chat. I'm sure he'll appreciate that. Bartosz, please take it away. Uh, thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> welcome uh, from Seattle. You can see downtown Seattle from here. Um, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to present uh, at this conference. Um, I'm going to talk about monoidal catamorphisms. It's, it's a, a weird uh, kind of um, weird words put together. Uh, so I'll, I'll explain a little bit uh, how uh, I got to that. Um, so my inspiration was uh, actually um, a talk by Gabriel Gonzalez uh, about folds. Um, it was a very interesting talk that I watched on YouTube. And um, it got my interest because it, it, I recognized two things that, that I'm really interested in. One is uh, that, it, that these folds looked very much like optics. And I'm interested in optics, in lenses and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> and on the other hand, it was, it's folds, so it deals with uh, recursion schemes. Um, but it was... Uh, only about uh, folding lists and I thought how can this be generalized to other uh, recursive data structures so this is this is how this whole thing started and um, I figured these things out and I wrote them down and and this is the result okay so let me start with with a um, picture 
Um, pe people often uh, compare data structures to real life uh, objects, uh, things from real life. So I have this image in my mind when I was thinking about uh, these monoidal catamorphisms. And this is, this is a, a, a bread uh, called panettone in Italian. But when I was a child, we used to, to have these kind of breads uh, also. And what I really liked doing is picking the raisins from, from these breads because I, I really loved raisins. So um, a monoidal catamorphism is you have a data structure like this panettone here, and you are picking the raisins from it. So these raisins are the monoidal values. So you have a data structure in which you have embedded monoidal values. Uh, it could be any, you know, it could be, say, integers, could be numbers, could be strings. You can concatenate strings, they form a monoid, right? All these things that you can combine, what well, you can call it multiplication, addition, uh, concatenation. There are many, many different kinds of monoids. Um, so you have a data structure, which is usually defined recursively, and then you have values hidden inside this data structure. And, and your goal is to traverse this data structure and pick the raisins and eat them, okay? So this is, um, <clears throat> and interestingly enough, <clears throat> this process can, can be uh, decomposed into two, um, sort of orthogonal activities. One is related to how the data structure is constructed, right? How, how this bread is baked. So it's, um, uh, it's a traversal of a data structure. And the completely different thing is what do you do with these monoidal values, right? How do you combine them and how do you produce the final result? And, and this, this kind of decomposition of problems into orthogonal uh, things is, is very useful in programming because you can write a separate library for traversing stuff, you can write a separate library for combining stuff, and then you combine the traversing with the combination and you get something, you know, many, many different possibilities. And the thing about monoids is why, why are they so useful and why, why do they appear everywhere? And monoid is, is just, uh, a data type that has some kind of multiplication or addition or concatenation, a, a binary operation, okay? So it's a binary operation that's, um, that has a unit, so sort of like concatenating an empty thing or multiplying by one or adding zero, and it's associative in the sense that you can group things differently, right? And this associativity is, is very useful when you want to parallel, parallelize your, your, your algorithm. Because then you can say, you know, I'm, I'm chopping this panettone into four pieces, right? And I'm going to pick raisins separately from each piece. And then at the end, combine the results. And because it's associative, it doesn't matter you know, in which order I combine them. I mean, the order, it's, like, it's not symmetric necessarily, right? Like concatenation of strings is not symmetric. Um, so it depends on order, but it doesn't depend on how you group them. So you can parenthesize any way you want, okay? So this is, this is why monoids are, are used in, in a lot in parallel programming. <clears throat> okay, so the basic thing, and this is, this is from uh, Gabriel's talk, um, <clears throat> is that when you have a data structure that already has monoidal values, then, then you're great. You can just like walk the data structure and combine the monoidal values. But in most cases, your data structure is, uh, contains a lot of uh, extraneous data, um, you have to sort of extract the monoidal values from it, right? Extract the, the, the raisins. Uh, so you might have a data structure that contains, let's say, records that have name, address, age, stuff like this, right? And you are only interested 
in, let's say, calculating average salary in, in, in your company, right? So you, will, you would add up all the salaries. You would traverse your, da your database, your data structure, right? And you would, you would use these, extract the salaries from these records. So you have a data structure that contains certain records, and from these records, you can extract monoidal values. So this is one part of this uh, operation. And this is what, what's in this picture. This, this is, there is a function from A to M, where M is a monoid. So you have a data structure that contains A's. These are some types. And there's a way of extracting or converting this A into a monoidal value. Now, once you have monoidal values, you can do stuff with them. You can combine them, you can reorder them in, and then combine or whatever, right? You can do the monoidal things with them. And at the end, when you are done with that, you want to take this monoidal result and convert it to something that you're interested in. So there's the second part, M to B, another function. So a fold that sort of tells you what you are interested within your data structure contains these two functions. One function that extracts monoidal values and another function that turns the result, monoidal result, into some other type, okay? And this is very much, this looks very much like, like what you do in optics when you are looking at a bigger data structure and you, you're focusing on something. So here you are focusing on these raisins, right? The monoidal values. And the other thing interesting about this is that you really don't want the client of this fold to know what monoid you are using. Like, what is the implementation of this monoid? All you want the, the client, and the client is doing the traversing and pushing the stuff through this first function, turning it into a monoidal values, and doing something with these monoidal values, but without knowing the details of what the monoid is. Are these numbers? Are these strings? Doesn't matter. What matters is, uh, that you can combine them, okay? So this is implemented in Haskell as, a, as an existential data type. This is, this is an example of an existential data type. So let me explain how you work with existential data types. So it's a type that's hiding some, kind, some implementation, right? So in order to hide implementation, you have to be able to construct it from some concrete implementation. So when you are constructing this fold, right, you have a particular monoid in mind, and you have these two functions that operate on this particular monoid. So this M is given. But when you are constructing it, you have to have a constructor that will work for any monoid, because you can construct the same thing using a different monoid and different pair of functions. This is why you have a polymorphic constructor. This for all M says that you have infinitely many constructors. One constructor per mon monoid. So there's one constructor for integers, one constructor for strings, one constructor for complex numbers, and so on and so forth, right? The only constraint is that this M has to be a monoid. So the fact that, that, that this is constructed with monoid means that, um, that when you are using this data structure, you can count on the fact that M is a monoid. And that means that there is a unit and then there is a uh, multiplication, which is associated. That's all you know, and you can use it. So when you are a client of a fold, right, of this data structure fold, uh, what you can do with, with it is you can extract these two functions. You can apply this first function to, to get monoidal values of the type you don't know. You can operate on them using monoidal functions, right? And then you can turn them back into something that you know, the B, right? So you know, e, you know A, you know B, but you don't know what monoid are you talking about. Right? So this is, this is why it's, this is called an existential data type. It hides 
and implementation. Right, and here's an example. This is, this is probably not the best, uh, not the fastest implementation, but it shows you how this is done. So Gabriel in his talk has, has a better implementation um, <clears throat> that actually is more efficient. But, but this is what, what, how you fold stuff using a fold, okay? So somebody gives you a fold with these two functions in them, right? One function I'll call 2m, and the other is from m. So one turns a's into monoids, the other turns this monoid value into b, right? So first you f map to m, which converts the contents of, in this case, a list. So this is for lists. The, the recursive data structure we're talking here about is a list. So, so you convert it into a list of monoidal values. Once you have a list of monoidal values, you can just multiply them together. And this is what mconcat does. And mconcat takes a list of monoidal values and just multiplies them. And it does it without knowing what the monoid is. It doesn't know what concrete monoid it is, but it knows it's a monoid. So it can do multiplication and it knows what unit is so that it can start with a unit and it just keep multiplying. Right, and the result is is uh, is then converted using from M to some uh, concrete type B, right? So so this is uh, this is the implementation that works for lists, right? And also notice one thing about uh, existential data types, and this, this is like true about all existential data types, is that an existential type, a data type ha has to have a producer and a consumer in it. So here we have a function that produces M's and another function that consumes M's. Because you don't, because you don't know what M is, right? Uh, you cannot produce it by yourself. You cannot consume it by yourself because you don't know what to do with it. So you have to have these two parts provided for you. Okay. So the interesting thing about these, uh, this fold is that it is a functor in the second argument, kind of obviously, because you can apply a function to it and convert the B result into something, into a C, right? Just by uh, postcomposing F to from M. But it's a more interesting factor because it's a monoidal factor. And, and this, this fact that it's a, it's, it's a monoidal factor means that you can take two folds like this and you can multiply these folds in a sense, right? So you have one fold for one monoid, you have another fold that hides another monoid, you can combine them. That's because you can combine monoids into pairs, okay? So a monoidal factor is something that has this to, uh, well, it has a value called init that's uh, a, a container that contains unit. <clears throat> this is the unit type, right? Um, and, and the second one, uh, if you have two containers, one containing A's and one containing B's, you can merge them together. You can, you can um, coalesce these two drops, right? And you get a a single container that contains pairs of ABs, okay? And this is very important. What, what, what Gabriel uh, talked about in his talk was, was that uh, um, you, can, you can use this stuff to create more complex uh, folds from, and it's essentially a monoidal functor is in Haskell automatically um, applicative. So applicative is kind of uh, more useful in when you're programming. Monoidal is more useful in understanding what it does. So it combines two folds into one fold. Okay, and here's, here's how, how you can show that this is indeed a monoidal factor, that fold is a monoidal factor. So I'm not going to go into the details. You can, you can look it up. Um, so now the other part of, of the picture. So that was the fold part of the picture. Now, uh, <clears throat> we, when we are traversing this, this list, okay, the question is uh, why can we generalize it to some 
mm, more uh, interesting uh, recursive data structure. So can we use recursion schemes with a fold? Okay, so that was, that was the problem that I was interested. So let me remind you a little bit how recursion schemes are built. Um, so you start with something called an algebra. So you have a functor. So think of a functor as a container of values. So you have a container of A's and you have, uh, the algebra is just an evaluator. So given, you give me a container that contains X, Y, Z of type A, I, I know how to extract a single value out of it, a single value of type A, right? So this cluster on the right is just like the single value that I might extract it. So an algebra for a given functor, you know, fixes a type A, so let's say integer, and then tells you, you give me a list of integers, I'll give you an integer out of it. For instance, by multiplying these or adding them or exponentiating them or whatever, right? Uh, or, or ignoring all of them. Um, that's also a possibility. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so this, this functor can contain, uh, because it's a container, it, it, it can contain any type in it. It doesn't really matter. We are interested in the structure of this container, not on the payload. So X, Y, Z here are the payload of, of this container. But the interesting thing is that once we have uh, a functor that can accept payload, we can put different things uh, as the payload. And in particular, we can kind of recursively tie the knot and say, well, the payload of this container will be this container itself, the type of the container itself. So it's sort of fractal-like develops, right? So you can think of this functor as defining a node in your data structure that contains some slots, right? And inside these slots, you are putting more nodes that contain slots. And in those slots, you are putting more nodes that contain slots and so on, okay? This, this doesn't, usually doesn't go into infinitely deep because, uh, most of these functors have something that terminates the recursion, that the leaves of, uh, or empty list is terminates recursion. Uh, a leaf of a tree terminates recursion. So, so these, these could be like finitely deep data structures, right? But, but their type is this kind of fractal type, right? And, and this is described by this data structure fix. So we see fix f is, a, is this data structure. f is the functor here, right? And it has this property that you can build it by filling f, the node, with fix f, right? So this is where, where you're recursing, you know? f is this node, and you're putting in the places where, where the raisins are, you know, you're putting itself, okay? So it's just, it's just like, grows indefinitely, okay? Um, <clears throat> so now, the beauty of, of recursion schemes is that you, when you define an algebra, you are telling uh, how to evaluate a single node, which is not a recursive thing, right? A node just has values of type A. When you say, you give me a node with values A, I'll tell you how to extract uh, a summary value of, of type A, right? But then you can, you want to apply this to a recursive data structure. So this is this recursive data structure and you want to extract some value out of it, right? How do you do this? And this is what is called a catamorphism. A catamorphism says, well, uh, it, it's a recursive function. So it first says, well, let's apply catamorphism to the contents of my node. So my node contains other nodes, right? So I can apply my catamorphism to these subnodes, or the children, right? Convert them to some value A. And once I have a node with values A, the X, Y, Z here, I can apply the algebra to evaluate this stuff, right? And I get the result. 
So this kata is, is, is just an expression of, of this fact that, you know, you can recursively, and, and this is so general because it, it says, you know, give me any functor f, no other constraints, it has to be a functor, right? Give me any algebra of this type f a to a, and here's the formula, right? You put it in the library once and for all, and then you can apply it to any data structure that's, that's recursive. So that's the beauty of it, right? But now we want to apply the same thing to the fold, okay? So this requires a little bit of generalization because we are now interested in stuff that's both recursive, so it has these placeholder for children, and also has a payload. And this payload, we want to convert it to a monoidal value, right? This is, this is our 2M will be uh, acting on the payload. But we didn't see the payload in this previous slide, right? Uh, we were only interested in like children, 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 children. But, but here, if you want to have separate payload from the recursion, then you need something that's called a bifunctor. So it's, it's, it's a container that has, contains both A's and B's, okay, in some way. And uh, the fact that it's being a bifunctor means that you can transform A's to A primes, and you can transform B's to B primes at the same time using two functions, right? So you have function F and G, you know, you apply one to the first, what apply one to the second. So these things are called bifunctors that have this property, right? Um, and the bifunctor is automatically a functor in the second uh, variable, right? In this, this placeholder variable. So we'll call the A payload and the second placeholder for children, right? And now if you forget about the payload, then you can look at this as a functor in terms of placeholders, and you can say, well, I'll apply my fixed point to it, right? And I'll get a tree or a, a list and whatever, uh, right? What, depending on what, what functor it is. Uh, and the payload is attached some, in some way because of this bifunctor, right? But now what we are doing with this when we are folding a list using a monoidal value. We said we can convert the A's into monoidal values, and then we can, uh, B's, uh, to B's we can apply this uh, recursive fixed point formula. So this will be a data structure that has payload A, and B's are filled with payload of payload of, uh, of nodes, of nodes, of nodes, of nodes, right? So we want to be able to convert the payload to some monoid, this pentagon at the bottom, that's, that's a monoidal values. Now we want to be able to evaluate this whole subtree or bunch of subtrees that, that B stands for, right? Also to a, to a monoidal value of the same monoid. And the algebra for this combines the payload with the recursive evaluation of the tree or whatever data structure we have, right? So this is, I call this M algebra, monoidal algebra, and it's defined for a monoid, right? So M is a monoid, and it just tells you how to calculate a single node as long as both parts have been converted to the same monoid. Right, so maybe you multiply them, you know, you pick some order of multiplication, whatever. This algebra tells you what, how to combine these things, right? And once you have this, you can define this catamorphism for a monoidal algebra. It's very similar to, and in fact, is implemented using a regular catamorphism. You just define an algebra, right? So you have an you start with an M, M algebra, this is the thing to the right, right, which contains payload that's been transformed into monoid, and then it has these children 
of the node that have been also recalculated and turned into a monoidal value. And M algebra tells you how to combine all these things into a single monoidal value, okay? And now this catamorphism takes this recursive data structure, applies this catamorphism to all its children, converts them to the pentagons. So the three pentagons you see, that's from converting for the recursive application of this catamorphism to children, and then uses M algebra to combine these converted things with the payload of this node, okay? And once you do this, you have converted it to a monoidal, single monoidal value, and then you can apply the second function from M to get your B. And that's it, that's, that's, that's the monoidal catamorphism. That's how it works. Uh, and of course you want an example, right? Because otherwise it would be difficult to uh, understand. Uh, so, so the example here is a tree data structure, okay? Uh, it's a very simple uh, tree that contains payload only in the leaves, okay? For simplicity. I mean, you can put payload also in the nodes if you want. So, <clears throat> so the definition of this, and this is a bifunctor. It's, it's a functor in A and it's a functor in R. So it's a functor in, in uh, payload A, right? Uh, and it's a functor in the placeholder R, okay? So each node contains two of these placeholders, so it's a binary tree, right? Because these placeholders are now replaced with recursively the same thing. So the whole type tree at the bottom here, type tree is a fixed point of tree F of A. So tree F of A is sort of curried version of this bifunctor. This bifunctor actually has two arguments, right? But we are doing a fixed point in the second argument. The first argument is just left there untouched. That's the payload, okay? So it's a tree that contains A's, right? And this is sort of, the, on the right, you, you see the shape of, of this tree, right? So, um, Usually when we define these recursive data structures and we want to construct something, we, we define these uh, um, smart constructors. So the, there is a smart constructor leaf and a smart constructor node. A leaf takes a value of type A and produces a tree. And tree is this recursive thing, right? It's no longer the single level node. Uh, but it's a, it's a whole blown tree. But this is a tree that only contains a leaf, right? And the node takes two trees, so full blown recursive trees, combines them into a node, and then and makes a fix of, of that, right? So here I'm constructing, using these smart constructors, leaf and node, I'm constructing a, a simple tree that contains doubles, okay? So this is, Payload here is double, okay? I picked double as a payload, and it has these three numbers as payload, okay? So it's a very simple example. You can put anything in them. You can put strings or uh, records or databases, whatever you want, okay? And now I'm defining a, a simple algebra, monoidal algebra. So this is an example of monoidal algebra. What does it do to a leaf? Okay, so monoidal algebra operates on the, on the node level. It's not a recursive thing. This is what, what, uh, how useful it is because you, you don't really like working with recursion. You want to separate recursion into your catamorphism, but you want to define your operations in a non-recursive level. So this is a non-recursive version. So you have an M algebra for the bifunctor 3F, 3F now is a bifunctor, right? And on a leaf that contains an M, an M is a monoidal value, right? We don't know what monoidal value, but it's a monoidal value. It just extracts M. So it produces a value of monoidal value, right? From a node that contains two monoidal values, 
it will produce a product, monoidal product of these two values. So that's like the simplest thing that you can do. Okay. So the algebra is defined in a very, very simplistic manner, right? <clears throat> and then with this algebra in mind, we are um, now separately creating this fold. So we are going back to the beginning. This is how folds were defined. It has to have two functions, one to monoid, one from monoid. Now we are, for, for the first time, creating something like this for a um, bigger data structure, for a tree data structure. So the two part, I'm calling it floor prime, um, it converts, uh, so, so this is a fold from double to string. So the first part has to take a double and convert it to, to a monoid value. So it converts it uh, to a monoid called sum, which is just integer. So some int, right? So integers form a monoid. Uh, actually, they form two kinds of monoids, sum and product. And we pick one, right? So this is an example where, where you are uh, deciding which monoid to use for this data structure. So floor prime uh, takes a double, calculates the floor of it, so turns it into an integer, and then turns this integer uh, into a sum integer, which means it's an integer still, but it has methods for multiplying, okay? So it's, it's a monoid, this, this double, uh, this operation, you know, the, the less than greater than is defined as addition, right? And then the other way around from monoid, uh, just takes this sum of um, data type, right? And turns into a string. So how does it do it? Well, extracts the integer from the sum. It's called get sum, and then applies show to it, okay? And in, <clears throat> indeed, when you, when you apply uh, a catamorphism, this, this cat that we defined previously, the monoidal catamorphism, maybe I should have called it mcat, to this algebra, so my alg, my fold, my tree. So you see, we have separated the problem into three orthogonal directions. We separately define an algebra, we separately define a fold, and we separately define a, a, a recursive data structure, right? And indeed, when you run it, it returns a string 13. Okay, you can check this. So this is essentially it. Um, <clears throat> what I did also, um, I translated into my favorite language of category theory and, and uh, <clears throat> I figured out that, that um, you know, the existential data type in category theory would be a, would be a co-end and then Cohen is defined with some laws and so on. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about this. It's too technical. But the bottom line of this is that when you define something as a Cohen, you get certain laws, right? And you might be asking yourself, so when, when, you, have, when you define a fold, um, does it have to satisfy certain laws? And yes, it, it does. It has to... It, it has to sort of uh, identify uh, different folds that convert stuff to different monoids. So as long as you have a way of converting one monoid to another monoid, that's called a monoid morphism. So here F is a monoid morphism from M to M, okay? Turns the monoid and converts it to another monoid. So a monoid morphism will have to take a unit of one monoid and map it to a unit of another monoid. And multiplication in one monoid to multiplication in, a, in another monoid. So that's called a monoid morphism. So if you have a monoid morphism and you have two, these two functions u and v, u converts it to m and v converts n to b, 
then there are two ways of forming a fold out of this. You can say, I'm first using U to extract monoidal values, then apply F. So I'm converting M to N. And now once I have N, I can convert it to B, right? And this is important when you are using these catamorphisms because you might decide, okay, I'm first converting the stuff, then doing the catamorphism, or I'm first doing a catamorphism and then converting the result using monoid morphism, right? And these two things should give you the same result. Otherwise, otherwise they could distinguish between different monoids, right? And you remember the monoid here is existential. So no matter what monoid is hidden inside your fold, the result should not depend on it. And that means exactly that if you have monoid morphism, you can apply it internally and you get the same result. So that's it. I think I'm right on time or even less, okay? <gasps> Hey, you know what? That was fabulous. Thank you, thank you, Bartosh, and everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, we do have one question so far. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, please feel free to ask questions, and I'll be happy to read them and get them answered for you. So we had an attendee ask. Um, so he, you might not have said it or he missed at the beginning, I think, why you were interested in monoidal algebras. So is this the usual algebra using functor or rather which, excuse me, or rather which part of an algebra did you want to ensure was monoidal? Does that make sense? Okay, I will read it again. <laughs> I think that was my fault. I think I slaughtered the question. So the question reads, I miss why Bartosh is interested in monoloidal algebras. Is the usual algebra using functor or rather which part of an algebra did he want to ensure was monoloidal? Ah, uh, okay. So this, this is a particular application of this general recursive scheme, right? It's just that uh, you take a particular recursive scheme that um, generates the catamorphism and fixed point and so on. I mean, all the, the, this is all known stuff. Um, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> when you apply it to a particular data type, that's monoidal, right? And then you have the opportunity to separate things nicely, okay? So this is like a further opportunity to decompose a problem into smaller problems, right? It's like recurs recursion schemes are already a way of decomposing problems into what do you do at a, at a node level? And then how do you traverse the fixed point, right? And this seems to be so um, useful, you know, like uh, for lists, we do it all the time. We do folds, right? Fold, fold is like a major, major thing. Uh, well, there is, there is a way of doing folds uh, for, for monoidal values. Right, and that that's uh, um, um, I think that's that's in foldable. It's like there is a data type in, in Haskell foldable that you can do this uh, fold map things like these, right? Uh, but this goes like a little step further and says, like, let me just um, abstract this monoidal part out of it into a separate data structure. And that's it, that's, there's not, no magic in it. It's just like, okay, if you can decompose the problem, it's probably a good idea to decompose it because it will be easier to solve when, when you have like a very, very complex problem and you can decompose in smaller, smaller, smaller problems. It's always useful. 
That's why I'm interested. And also because it reminded me of optics. Okay, that's cool. Makes sense to me. Um, take care of small problems first and then move on. Yeah. Um, okay, so our next question is, have you already thought about practical use cases where this can be useful? <laughs> uh, gosh, I'm not a very practical person. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I just see patterns and I, I, I solve them. But I definitely I, I should probably provide the link to Gabriel's uh, talk because um, he actually he he came up with this stuff because he was solving a real life problem, right? And um, uh, I don't know if he mentioned this or this is this is sort of an, an obvious thing that anytime you you deal with uh, parallelism or distribution, distributed distributed systems, uh, converting stuff to monoidal values is the way to go, right? So this is like a known thing, right? So you know if you want to do like map reduce something like that, you know. This is this is a uh, theoretical framework for doing these things, and you can do it efficiently. I mean, I I didn't show you how to do it efficiently, but Gab and Gabriel implemented the stuff using efficient algorithms. And I was also thinking, you know, it's like, okay, once I have a catamorphism, you know, maybe I can combine it with an anamorphism and do a hylomorphism, but I, I never got into this, you know, but like, it would be an interesting thing to, to, to do some kind of hylomorphism, monoidal hylomorphism, you know, if, you, if, if any of you wants to like study this stuff, it, it's, it would be really interesting. Yeah. Dig into the deep end. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you. So our next question is, do monoids or other algebraic structures fit well with other recursion schemes too? Curious if any examples come to mind. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, a, a, a monoid is, is a way of combining values. So that's how I see a monoid. Right, um, so this is why it's it seems like it's a good fit with with a catamorphism, right? Um, now there are other recursion schemes that are based on catamorphisms, um, so you know maybe maybe uh, with some mon uh, monadic values uh, um, in there and so on. Um, then of course. Everybody knows that um, monad is a monoid in the category <laughs> of um, functors, endofunctors, right? So uh, who knows? Maybe one can generalize it even one level up with with um, monads. I don't know. And and okay, so like totally. Um, random thought, you know, it's like, if monoids go with catamorphisms, then what would go with anamorphisms? Maybe co-monoids, right? There are co-monoids. They kind of the opposite, they split stuff, right? I haven't looked into it, but just random thought. I, I smell a fun like programming <laughs> like or like group discussion here um not on the webinar but later maybe <laughs> um okay so next question how does this remind you of optics um okay so this like what the simplest answer would be uh, you can, you can, let's say um, the simplest example of optics or the more um, simplest interesting example is, is a lens, right? And you can think of a lens as taking a, a data structure 
A and splitting it <clears throat> into the focus and the rest. And then a lens lets you operate on this focus, maybe change its type, combine with the rest again and get the final result. And the thing is that the, the rest there is defined as an existential thing because you're not really interested in, and you're not going to do anything with this rest other than recombine it with a modified focus. Okay, so here, you know, you're sort of focusing on the monoidal value that's inside A, and you can modify it, right? Using only limited knowledge. It's like in, in, a, in a lens, your limited knowledge is essentially zero, right? It's like uh, the, 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 this um, residue thing, you can't do anything with it other than combine it back with, with the focus, right? Uh, here, you have this existential thing that you almost, you can almost do nothing with it, except that you know it's a monoid. So it's, a, it's an interesting. So you have a little bit of ability and you can use it to your advantage, right? So this, it's like, you know, the splitting of, of one data structure into something, doing something and recombining it into, into something is so typical optics and this existential thing in between is so typical optics that when, when I saw this formula, I said, wow, this is, this is optics. It's just like, this is the pattern I know. Okay. Um, is, the, is the category of breads a slice category? Slice <laughs> that is pretty great. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, we have, thank you. Um, so we had a question, I think it's kind of, uh, let's see, so why, so he's wondering why you used monoids instead of a semi-group. He says, I don't, I don't see empty used anywhere. Oh, because my example was trivial. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a more complicated example, you would have to say, okay, like if you, if you were storing data in nodes instead of leaves, and leaves have no data, how would you convert them to a monoid? You would have to convert them into a unit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so he kind of followed that up with, um, in the middle, he saw you explain functor is a way to fold. Um, and there's an equation there. I don't want to, um, so it's, it's an F and then F of A to A. a. F of A, there we go. But I thought that that functor is more like working with each value individually, like a map. So it's F of A to F of B. And he's wondering if he understands that correctly. Okay, I, I'm, I, I, see the, uh, I see the question. Functors as way to fold. Well, not, not really. I mean, a functor itself is just, uh, a, what a functor does is, is lets you replace one value with another inside a functor, right? You, you can map, right? Folding is uh, always related to some algebra. So you have to have an algebra. You have to have a way of extracting stuff, evaluating stuff that's hidden in, in a, in a uh, functor. So if a functor is like a container of stuff, an algebra tells you how to get stuff out of this container, like summarize this container, right? Yeah. Okay, so hopefully that helps clarify that. And if not, you can totally ask a further question. But 
in the meantime, just in case, we have our last question of the day so far. So um, if I understand correctly, if I were writing, for example, a compiler okay. folding AST tree to list of assembly instructions, uh -huh. with this approach, I could decompose the problem into two things. One, going from single element of AST tree to an instruction set, a to M, yeah. To M. And then the second part is then actually doing something with the final set of instructions, like for example, printing them M to B. Is this correct? Uh -huh. Yeah, I guess. I mean, if you can think of an AST tree uh, transforming it into a, a, an assembly program, right? An assembly program, you can think it's a concatenation of assembly instructions in the sense, right? So it, it has this monoidal uh, nature to it. And you have an empty instruction that's like a unit, right? And you can concatenate them into a program. So, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a possibility. Mm-hmm, mm hmm I haven't thought of that, but, but yeah. He says, cool. It's a, tree. <laughs> it's a tree, it's a recursive data structure, AST tree, absolutely. And you want to extract the monoidal value out of it, you know? So if you want to combine things, traverse the tree and combine the results, yeah, that's, that's a catamorphism, yeah. Well, that's fun. I like it. So, Unless something else pops up, that is the end of our questions for today. Um, thank you so much for this talk, Bartos. It's been, I mean, I think I even got some of that personally. But <laughs> I, I liked the pictures, the pictures helped me. Um, so thank you very much. Um, for yes, thank you, and on and behalf of talk. all the attendees who wish they could clap but can't, <laughs> they can talk in chat. I know, clap in chat. I know I'm speaking for all of them when I say that was a great talk. Thank you very much for giving that. Thank you for this opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah, I see them on the Zoom chat now just saying thank you, thank you, thank you, clap, clap, clap. <laughs> okay. It's all virtual, unfortunately. But no, a lot of people appreciate you being here today and sharing your passion and knowledge of category theory with fellow programmers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, until next time. <laughs>